In November 2010, I was a bright-eyed 11-year-old who'd just discovered the joys of Xbox Live, spending my nights after school and weekends playing Halo 3 and Modern Warfare 2 with my friends. I remember the hype surrounding the reveal of the next Call of Duty, and I remember the excitement I felt when we finally got the name, Call of Duty Black Ops, a Cold War-era game developed by Treyarch. I remember watching every trailer and every gameplay demo on repeat for days. I wanted to know everything there was to know about the game, and hearing about the new features for multiplayer coupled with the anticipation for the next chapter of Zombies had me absolutely hooked. When November 9th, 2010 finally came and I had the game in hand, you can guess what I booted up first. That's right, I played the campaign. What? I'm not entirely sure why I did this, considering my hype for multiplayer and zombies, but if I had to guess, I'd say it was because I've always been compelled to at least start the campaign of whatever new game I got. Maybe it's a leftover habit from growing up on single-player games, or maybe it's something entirely different. Regardless of the reason, though, I played Black Ops 1's campaign over the course of the week that followed, and I really enjoyed it. But I didn't get the game for the story. I got the game for the multiplayer and zombies, to have fun late into the night with my friends playing wager matches or going for higher rounds. Fast forward to today though, and I've changed a lot as a person and a gamer. In the decades since Black Ops 1's launch, I've played thousands of hours of FPS's and I'm starting to burn out on them. The direction the industry has taken recently with microtransactions and FOMO only accentuating this feeling. As a result, I've started playing more single-player games and have really enjoyed expanding my tastes in games by trying out genres I never thought I would. Despite this newfound joy, though, there is still a part of me bitter about the way multiplayer games have gone. So, I made a video about my feelings, which has done really well, so thank you all for that. For that video, I went back and recorded some Black Ops 2 gameplay against bots. It was a ton of fun and it made me want to go back and replay the story. I didn't want to just go back to Black Ops 2, though. I wanted to go back to the beginning. Not World at War. I know that game is technically connected to the Black Ops franchise, but I think it stands far better as a solo project, and I will cover it someday. I mean, how could I not? It's one of my favorites of all time. But no, for this nostalgia trip, I just wanted to go back to Black Ops 1. It'd been some years since I last touched the game's campaign, and I had obviously changed as a person since then. I'd matured quite a bit and learned a lot more about the time period the game is set in, so I was anxious to see if the game would hit different with all of that extra content and knowledge in my brain. There were no doubts in my head that the game would be just as good as I remembered it being, but I wanted to know if it could get even better. Well, thankfully, it did. It was so much better, in fact, that I decided to make an entire retrospective slash review on it. Everything from the presentation and atmosphere to the characters and story are dripping with excellence. Just like World at War before it, Black Ops 1 presents a real, gritty interpretation of these Cold War conflicts. However, it also manages to blend in some cheesy B-movie action sequences without them feeling too over the top. It's just enough to keep you engaged during gameplay while the story keeps up the suspense in between levels. It's a potent combo that makes it hard to put the game down. So, with all that being said, I hope you'll join me on this journey as we break down and discuss this landmark title in the Call of Duty franchise. This is Call of Duty Black Ops. When the game begins, we find ourselves in the restrained shoes of Alex Mason, a CIA operative who is being questioned by an unknown entity. Surrounded by screens and drenched in lights, Mason is relentlessly asked questions by his interrogator about numbers and broadcast stations, to which he has no answers. A man named Dragovich in the Bay of Pigs invasion is brought up, which leads into our first flashback slash level. It's also here where we watch the first of many loading screen cinematics. 
I've never seen anything like this in a game before or since Black Ops 1, and that's a shame because these are so cool. They remind me of the same cinematics from World at War, just on steroids. The way real life images and videos are cut between what I believe are shots from Mason's POV is dizzying in a good way. They really put you into Mason's headspace as he is reliving all of these events. And through it all, the blood red numbers float and highlight the things you see. They're always there, subtly influencing and distorting Mason's memories. The police are gonna be here soon. Let's make this quick. Woods, it's been a while. When we start the first mission properly, we're greeted by our teammates, Woods, Bowman, and Carlos, as we get some intel for our operation the following day. The bar we're in is then set upon by soldiers who question us. Where are you from? Just be cool, Woods. Wait. I'm talking to you! One stabbed hand and smash bottle later, and we're fighting through the streets of Cuba as we escape the police. There's a super cool driving section towards the end as we slow-mo fade into a transitional video that shows what effect this is having on Mason in the present as he begins to lose consciousness, but is quickly shocked awake by his captors. We're losing him. Doing the gap. We have no choice. Back in the game, we find ourselves outside of a compound. This is where our target, Fidel Castro, is. After ziplining our way in, we fight with Woods and Bowman through the compound towards Castro's room. We kick in the door and get a beautiful slow-mo shot following the bullet into his skull. You ready to make history? With our objective complete, it's time to make our escape. We fight our way to the airfield and board a plane, but the runway is blocked by a convoy of enemy vehicles. Mason leaps from the plane and destroys the convoy, clearing the way for his squad, but he gets captured by the enemy in the process. He's then brought before a trio of men, one of whom is the real Castro. It turns out we killed a double. The other two are Kravchenko and Dragovich, two Russians who are the main antagonists of the game. Castro hands Mason over as a gift to the Russians, and he's sent to a labor camp called Vorkuta in northern Russia. Many things happen to Mason in Vorkuta during his time there, but one of the most notable is his befriending one Viktor Reznov. Fans of the Call of Duty franchise will know who this guy is, our badass Russian captain from Treyarch's previous game, World at War returns in a glorious, unexpected fashion. Seeing this man again made me squee with joy my first time playing. He's one of my favorite characters from World at War, and I was not expecting him to return in Black Ops. Yet, here he was. So, Reznov, how you doing, my guy? It's been a while! Oh, nice to see you too. As it turns out, our fight here is staged to get a guard to come down and break it up. We seize the opportunity to knock him out and steal his keys. After all, it is step one. Every journey begins with a single step. This is step one! Security! No! We take Bokuta! We then... From with only a shiv to our name. One thing about this level that I love is the progression of power. You start with nothing but a cobbled together blade, then shortly after, you acquire a pistol, and then after that, you get a shotgun. Beyond that point, it kind of snowballs and you get proper weapons, but for a while, it felt very zombies-like how you slowly gained power as you went on, which is something you rarely see in Call of Duty campaigns. It's only natural, then, that this level should end with a goddamn minigun section. After tearing the prison to shreds with said minigun, Mason is knocked unconscious by tear gas, but is taken to safety by Reznov, who reveals your escape method. The door will not hold them forever. We do not have much time. Within this shrine, to the hypocritical decadence of our leaders, 
place the key to step eight. Freedom. In a sequence very similar to the snowmobile escape from Modern Warfare 2, the duo ride motorcycles away from the prison, eventually hijacking a truck with Reznov driving while Mason guns. We then approach a train and Mason leaps aboard, calling back for his friend to do the same. Reznov, however, refuses and is presumably recaptured as we escape. What follows is a non-combat mission where we're brought to the Pentagon by our handler, Hudson, and the then Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara. We get various shots of our main characters, but also of the people around them. The whole thing comes off as disorienting, which is 100% intentional and well executed by the devs. As this happens, Mason monologues about the paranoia felt during that time, which connects again to the real history of the Cold War. We pass through multiple security checkpoints on our descent into the bowels of the Pentagon until we reach a sort of bunker room where we meet with President John F. Kennedy. As the president walks to sit with us though, there's a brief moment where time slows and the television behind Kennedy starts displaying real historical footage of his funeral and pictures of Lee Harvey Oswald. It really nails home the psychosis Mason is experiencing at this point and is an unnerving touch as we know the president's fate in reality. That just makes this meeting all the more awesome though. Time returns to normal and President Kennedy sits with us to discuss Dragovich. As soon as the Russian's name is mentioned, though... Dragovich. This moment comes out of nowhere, and the screeching sound it plays scared the crap out of me as a kid. Our breakdown goes as quickly as it came on, though, and the president assigns us the task of killing Dragovich. The scene then fades to white with a chorus of angelic voices, and we're launched into the next mission. For the next few levels, not much of note happens. We blow up a Russian missile. Oh, shit. It's a hell of a way to test the prototype. Fucking A. And fortunate son our way through Vietnam. Mason. Woods, you look like having shit. I'm so tough as shit in the jungle. It's not, baby. You know, the usual. Although, during this time, Mason's obsession with killing Dragovich begins to grow, and will continue to build as the game plays out. Keep this in the back of your mind going forward. Our antics lead into the mission The Defector, where Mason and Woods are dropped into a war-torn city to secure a Russian defector who has vital intel on Dragovich, and the attack he's planning on the West. As it turns out, the defector is none other than... Reznov, how'd you get out of Vakuda? Never thought I'd see you alive. Not are you, my friend. He hands over the file we're looking for, and we all make our grand, explosive escape. So much for a tent ceasefire. The enemy's courage could be the result of their newfound ally. Meanwhile, in Hong Kong. Hudson is interrogating a man named Daniel Clark, who has close ties to Dragovich and a biochemical weapon known as Nova 6. He's joined by Weaver, who appeared in a previous level alongside Mason. The interrogation is interrupted by Russian forces, and the trio fight their way across the rain-drenched rooftops. This level is a highlight for me personally because of its atmosphere with the rain and the vertical gameplay provided by the setting. It's almost Mirror's Edge-esque how you leap from rooftop to rooftop, having gunfights with enemies as you make your way to the ground. Obviously, you can't move like you can in Mirror's Edge, but the vibe is still there. During this escape, we end up slipping on a slick rooftop but manage to hold on. While dangling over a precarious drop, Hudson asks Clark more questions while bullets whiz past. Before he can reveal what the numbers mean, though... Hudson and Weaver manage to escape with their lives at least, but are still no closer to figuring out what the numbers mean. One interesting note I'd like to make about this level is what Hudson says to Clark just before the Russians attack. Until this all day, 
We got plenty of windows. Or you can give us what we want and we guarantee your safety. <laughs> it's the same thing your captor says at the beginning of the game. The numbers, basically. What do they mean? Where are they brought I don't know anything from? about any numbers. What about Dragovich? Do you remember him? Give us what we want, we'll guarantee your safety. That, coupled with Hudson's focus on the numbers, should clue you into who your captors are way ahead of time if you're paying attention. Something that I definitely didn't do my first time through, though I was 11. What do you expect from me? Anyway, up next is a flashback of a flashback as Mason recounts Reznov's story of the origins of Project Nova. Back in 1945, Reznov was under the command of Dragovich, alongside a previous playable character from World at War, Dmitry Petrenko. We're once again killing Nazis as we search for a German scientist named Friedrich Steiner in the Arctic Circle. As a big fan of World at War, this mission was a real treat. To hear the Russian theme music and use World War II era weapons like the PPSH and Mosin again was nothing short of phenomenal. From World at War to Black Ops 2, Treyarch focused intently on connecting their games, even going as far as porting over old weapons from past titles to be used in the campaigns of newer ones. It's a shame we don't get this level of cohesion anymore, but for these three it was a thing of beauty and really helps them feel like parts of the same narrative, yet unique enough to stand on their own. Back in the Arctic, we finally find Steiner. Against our Nazi killing instincts, we take him to Dragovich and the German leads us to a destroyed research ship where Nova 6 was developed. We then board the ship and make our way through the dark, desolate corridors until reaching the labs containing the deadly bioweapon. Upon reaching this room, Dragovich wants to see the effectiveness of the gas for himself and orders Reznov and his men to be used as test subjects. We as Reznov are spared of course, but we must watch as Dmitri dies like a rat in a cage before our very eyes. A character we played as in the last game, the hero of Stalingrad and a close friend to Reznov himself, doesn't get the honorable death he deserved. This betrayal ignites a spark of revenge not only in Reznov, but also the player. And suddenly, we also want what Reznov wants. Dragovich, Kravchenko, Stein. These men must die. So when British forces attack the ship, we seize the opportunity to escape and destroy the ship by setting a timed explosive charge as we leave. We do manage to get off the ship before it blows, but are captured by the Russians once again. This is how Reznov ended up in Vorkuta. Again, for the next couple levels, nothing too notable happens. We fight through some jungles with our crew, including Reznov, and are eventually captured by the Russians after investigating a crashed plane connected to Dragovich and Project Nova. Afterwards, we're put in the boots of an SR-71 pilot to provide assistance to Hudson and his team. Due to heavy snowfall, visibility on the ground is limited, so we have to guide the team through the blizzard. What's particularly cool about this section is the transitions between the air and ground. One minute, you're guiding little white blips to safety. The next, you're playing as those little white blips, silently killing Russian soldiers. It's a great palate cleanser after the action-packed levels we just played, and serves as a bit of a callback to the AC-130 level from COD 4, just done in Treyarch fashion. Eventually, we switch over to playing solely as Hudson to infiltrate a comm station. Our goal here is to take down enemy communications so we can enter the main research labs to gather intel on Project Nova. We do so in the most over-the-top way possible. Ready? Ready when you are. The sounds of battle disturb the snow and shake the ground so violently it causes an avalanche. This forces us to make a daring escape. Finally, at the main labs, we break in and find it abandoned. Suddenly, we're contacted by Steiner, the German scientist from the World War II flashback. He offers up what he knows in exchange for safety, and says he's on Rebirth Island. 
After gathering what they can, Hudson and his team make their final escape as the avalanche reaches their location at the bottom of the mountain. Meanwhile, Mason, Woods, and Bowman are being held captive in Laos. As Mason, we're pulled from our cage and sat at a table with Bowman, who's visibly shaken. A revolver is on the table between us, and we realize they're going to have us play Russian Roulette. Bowman, however, is defiant to the bitter end. A Spetsnaz operator violently beats him with a pipe for his refusal to play, and Woods is brought in in his place. The situation grows even more dire as he and Mason try to come up with a plan. At the demands of their captors, Woods plays the game. What's the plan? I'm thinking. I'm thinking. No talk! One chance, Mason. I'm thinking. Okay. You can't kill me! You shoot, G.I., you shoot! Fuck! Since he survived, now it's our turn to shoot. We seize our chance, with one bullet, to begin our escape. This entire sequence is masterfully executed. From the very beginning, we know we're screwed, but also that we'll make it out somehow. Having Bowman broken before us but still not giving in, only to have him killed right in front of our eyes, gets us angry. Bowman was our friend and squad mate since the first level, and although he didn't get much in the way of characterization, his brutal death in this dark cave is enough to get us pissed. Which is exactly how Mason and Woods are feeling at this moment, as they have to come up with a plan on the fly while being forced to play this awful game. The music builds in the background as the aggressive voices of our captors shout at us to stop talking and play. Woods literally hits fuck it and does so. By sheer luck, he survives, and with even more luck, he and Mason get the one bullet they need to break free. It's a tense scene that was executed with precision. Treyarch knew exactly how to get the player in the right state of mind for this level, and I don't know if it could have been done any better. After our miraculous escape, we fight our way through the cave system and kill the Spetsnaz operative before he can warn the Russian forces. We then emerge into a clearing, where we hijack a Russian helicopter and raise hell across the jungle as we travel to Kravchenko's compound. This was a sequence shown off in demos for the game, and I remember being so hyped when I saw it. Being able to pilot a helicopter in Call of Duty had never been done before up to this point, and the Mad Lads at Treyarch pulled it off beautifully with this cathartic, vengeance-fueled action set piece. With revenge served, we land on the ground again. Mason and Woods get to the compound and release some POWs, including our good friend Viktor Reznov. He tells us we must travel deeper into the base to kill Kravchenko, despite Woods suggesting we escape into the jungle with those we rescued. Mason ignores Woods and orders them all to attack the compound. Upon reaching Kravchenko's office, Not this time, American. Notice how, during the beating, Mason began hearing the numbers broadcast in his head. This becomes crystal clear after Wood's sacrifice as the screen fades to black. We come to again, believing Woods to be standing over us, but it turns out to be Reznov. He helps us to our feet, and we discover Steiner's location on Rebirth Island. The pair then travel there to kill the German for his part in the betrayal against Reznov. In what is the most ambitious level of the entire game, Rebirth begins with Mason and Reznov hiding inside of a shipping container. They sneak their way through the Rebirth Island facility in search of Steiner, 
avoiding patrols and helicopters as they go. Upon reaching the roof, the pair see a large explosion on the far end of the island. The CIA are here, and they're trying to take Steiner alive. With the island on full alert, Mason and Reznov quicken their pace to reach the scientists first. They break into the labs proper, fighting through various experimentation and examination rooms. During this time, Hudson contacts Mason, telling him that they know he's on Rebirth Island. Mason doesn't respond, and when he and Reznov finally reach Steiner... Trikovich's men are rounding up everyone on the island! Those no longer essential to his plans are being executed! You must hurry before they kill me too! Friedrich Steiner, this is the you? end. I know you, Borkuta. You don't know what we did to you. Mason, talk to me. Your evil has claimed the lives of many good men. No longer. Killing me will not stop Nova. I do not care. The scene changes back to Mason in the interrogation room. He swears up and down that his version of events is what happened, but his captor claims it was Mason who killed Steiner, not Reznov. He goes on to explain that Hudson saw what happened, and the level begins again, except this time we play from the perspective of Hudson and the CIA as they assault the lab. We begin with a pretty cool turret section until our BTR is destroyed by a helicopter. With the Nova 6 deployed, we put on our hazmat suit, but now there's a new gameplay aspect. Our suit can take permanent damage, and if it takes too much, we will die. This is shown to the player by cracks forming in the mass that don't go away, even after your health is regenerated. With the thick smoke of the Nova 6 clouding our vision also, we must use the IR scope on our rifle to identify enemies. All of these aspects combine to make a pretty sick fight sequence that is like nothing else in the game. I'm surprised I forgot about it before this playthrough, honestly. Anyway, once we're clear of the gas, we begin our assault on the labs properly. We enter a decontamination chamber with Weaver and make the same radio call to Mason that we heard earlier. Eventually, Hudson and Weaver reach the labs Mason made his way through, finding the carnage he left behind. Steiner contacts you, and you hear the same dialogue he was speaking when you entered his room as Mason. Hudson and Weaver then enter a large room next to Steiner's lab, and we see Mason, by himself, executing Steiner. We manage to shatter the glass and break through, but not before Steiner is killed. Hudson restrains Mason, and with Steiner dead, they have no link to the numbers broadcast except for Mason himself, so they take him into custody to try and extract the information they need. In the penultimate level of the game, Mason's captors argue about if he can decode the numbers or not. Everything they've tried has failed, so they play their final card. Not yet. I have one more card to play. Get out of here, Weaver. Tell them I failed. You want to die with him? Your choice. Finally seeing that door open and watching Hudson walk through, while not unexpected given the last mission, was oddly cathartic. After spending hours wondering who was talking to us, where we were, and what lies beyond that ominous door that's been clearly in the background all game, getting out of our chair and walking out was a relief. Finally, we would get some answers. But it wasn't what we expected at all. As Mason, we stumble through the halls of our prison, hearing voices and numbers playing over and over in our head while flashes of memories shoot across our vision. 
As he goes, Mason begins to remember what happened to him in Vorkuta. The Russians attempted to brainwash him into killing the president, but his mental resilience kept Mason from responding consistently to orders. Dragovich considers him useless and sends him back to his cell. After the cutscene showing this, however, Mason says this. We'll talk about this more at the ending, but keep this line of dialogue in mind as we go forward. Entering a room, we're soon surrounded by projections of Reznov on the walls and even on the papers scattered around the place. His voice plays over and over in our head as he recites various lines he said in Vorkuta. We exit the room and enter a hallway which quickly breaks apart showing us the missile we blew up in a previous mission taking off. This is intercut with scenes of Kennedy and of our supposed assassination of Dragovich. Also, as a side note, the way the objective marker floats away from you here adds an eerie feeling to the scene, almost like it's a ghost as you follow it. When we finally catch up with our phantom marker, though, Dragovich brainwashed you, but Reznov had plans of his own. Yes. Reznov. How'd you get out of Vakuda? Never thought I'd see you alive. He was never in Vietnam. The real defector with the Nova 6 dossier died during the attack on the Mac V. He was never in the rat tunnels. What the fuck's wrong? Never at Rebirth Island. My name is Victor. Reznov. Mason. My name is Victor. Reznov. And I will have my revenge. Mason, no! Step eight, Reznov. Freedom for you, Mason. Not for me. Victor Reznov's been dead for five years. He died at Vorkuta during the escape. All the years you thought he was with you, that was just in your mind. I trusted him. That's why it worked. It was their attempt at MK Ultra. Dragovich programmed you to kill Kennedy, but Reznov sabotaged you. He wanted revenge for all the Dragovich done to him. Dragovich, Kravchenko, Steiner, three new victims. There are gaps in your memory. Periods where you went MIA and we couldn't account for you. But now that the brainwashing's been broken, all that lost time will come back. We need to leave. The Nova 6 strike is imminent. Hundreds of sleeper agents, hidden in every state capital, are about to unleash this poison on your own countrymen. When Steiner died, we lost our key to unlocking the location of number broadcasts. You were programmed at Vorkuta to translate the number codes. Only you can tell us what the codes mean. Nova 6 was just one of the sleeper operations, but I'm sure there were others. Ones we didn't even know about. We have the broadcasts. We played them to you over and over again for hours, but we haven't been able to break through your programming yet. Mason, this is our last shot. Listen, for God's sake, listen again. With the truth finally revealed to us, Hudson plays the numbers broadcast once more. In a very dreamlike sequence, we relive many of the key moments throughout the story and literally walk through the numbers all while hearing Dragovich's message. It's then that we realize where the broadcast station is. It's on a ship in Cuba named the Rusulka. The same ship we saw behind Castro, Kravchenko, and Dragovich in the very beginning of the game. This is such a cool moment that brings the entire story full circle, and I love how this was all set up. The answer was literally right in front of you from the very get-go, you just didn't know it yet. Again, we'll talk about this after the recap, but I had to highlight this beautifully crafted scene. Now knowing where the numbers are being broadcast from, we tell Hudson and get this little goofy moment. Where? Cuba. Cuba. 
I'm sure it's meant to come off as this badass, like, let's go get him kind of thing, but it really comes off as hilarious to me now. I wish I had recorded my voice with the gameplay, because I laughed so hard when this happened. Especially considering the revelations that just took place, this equip sunglasses moment comes completely out of left field. Anyway, with the brainwashing undone now, we transition into the final mission. But there is something notable with the loading screen this time around. While still chaotic, there are no numbers in this cutscene, and we don't hear the voice of our interrogator anymore. It's strictly business, as we see various slides showing our mission plan while voices of other people play in the background. I only just noticed this subtle way of conveying Mason's new mental clarity as I'm writing the script, and it is such a cool detail. After the load, our mission begins in the helicopter, where we rain down bullets and missiles onto the Rasulka before boarding her ourselves. We fight our way through the ship, only to realize the actual broadcast station is deep under the water. The plan then becomes to sink the Rasulka to stop the broadcast, but Mason still insists they go down to kill Dragovich. He's no longer brainwashed, but knows the Russian is a huge threat to the world and should be dealt with while they have him. Hudson agrees, and they take a small team deep underwater to the facility. There, they fight to the main computer responsible for broadcasting the numbers and encounter Dragovich. Dragovich. You should have been my finest agent. It would have all been so much simpler. Dragovich! Yes! I'm gonna kill you! Try to fuck with my mind! Be quiet! You don't know anything! Looks like a tyranny against my own! Looks like I'm making kill my own president! Right? <sighs> After taking out the trash, Hudson and Mason stumble their way out of the facility as it floods with water. They manage to make it and begin swimming to the surface. As he does so, Mason hears one last line from Reznov, and he and Hudson miraculously don't drown. Seriously, there's no way this is humanly possible, but the rule of cool applies here, I suppose. Once we break the surface, we're pulled aboard a boat by Weaver, and another cheesy cinematic plays. It is over. We won. For now. Again, more guitar riffs that clash with the tone of the scene. I feel like some hopeful orchestra would have been a bit more satisfying, but it's not a deal breaker and it did make me crack a grin. That's not the true end, however. We fade into a blur of numbers and ultimately into a video of a woman reciting the number sequence. This cuts into real footage of JFK landing in Dallas on the day of his death. The woman continues to recite the numbers in the background, with Mason's voice interjecting sporadically. Somber music is heard as the footage plays until it abruptly stops and rewinds. And that is how the game ends, with strong implications that Dragovich's brainwashing did work and Mason did kill JFK. Of course, if you're familiar with US history or the JFK assassination more specifically, you know there are tons of theories regarding just who did it. Officially, Lee Harvey Oswald was charged with the crime, but even that story has some holes and never got to see a proper conclusion, as Oswald was killed by a man named Jack Ruby before he could face trial. Still, despite the official ruling, many have speculated there was more to JFK's assassination than just Oswald. 
Some have posited the possibility of a second shooter who was never caught, and it seems that Treyarch was playing off this theory. As evidenced by Mason's literal brainwashing, the periods of time he went MIA, that little line about Oswald during his major breakdown, and obviously him being in the footage played at the end of the game. It's an interesting part of the plot that plays even more off the real world history and paranoia of the time, and it's all left up to interpretation with no clear cut answer. <laughs> really great stuff. In fact, the entire story from start to finish is simply masterful. Black Ops 1 introduced us to now iconic characters with Mason, Woods, Hudson, and Weaver, as well as bringing back and further elevating past characters in Viktor Reznov and Dmitry Petrenko. Reznov in particular was an excellent choice as fans of World at War would know and trust him immediately. I know I did. This makes his betrayal and the ending all the more gut-wrenching for longtime fans. But even if you don't know who Reznov is going in, the plot twist ending is still a slap in the face. This is because we witness most of the story through Mason's eyes. There are a few missions as Hudson, sure, but Mason isn't present in those levels until Rebirth, so you don't get to see things from a different perspective until the very end. So, we've got no other choice but to believe Mason's version of events, which allows us to be just as shocked by the revelations as he is. We quite literally inhabit this man's mind, and Treyarch did an amazing job of executing that. There are some subtle cues, such as how characters other than Mason never directly interact with Reznov and the numbers sequence playing whenever he's on screen post Vorkuta. Overall, Black Ops 1 really dives deep into its aesthetic. I mentioned the loading screens, but a small thing like the black lines that cover up details of your missions as you begin them is a nice touch that adds to the deniable operations angle. Speaking more broadly, each level and area we play through is extremely detailed and dripping with atmosphere. Burning cities, rainy jungles, and snowy mountains are just a few of the locales you fight through, and they're all immersive, especially for a game that's over 12 years old. None of the environments are as dreary or oppressive as World at War's, but it's plainly obvious that the same passionate team is behind these levels. Besides, Black Ops 1 isn't going for a dark, gritty interpretation of war. Instead, it shoots for the B-movie action style that many of the COD games post-MW2 shot for. Scenes like Woods jumping into a boat while the city explodes behind him or assaulting the Rasulka are prime examples of this. The cheesy guitar riffs I highlighted are also byproducts of this tone, but like I said, they didn't really spoil the game for me as much as make me chuckle or grin. Finally, I'd like to highlight the main menu. It's a small thing, but I was blown away when I first saw it. Being able to turn my head and look around while the actual menu is on the TV in front of me is cool even to this day. On top of that, you can break out of your restraints and explore the room itself. There's not much, but there is an old computer you can go to to input various codes to unlock things, read extra lore, and even play an old Activision text-based game from the 70s. It's not a lot, but it is a nice detail and reward for those who want a little more from the game. The menu also shifts when you select zombies, turning reddish-orange and replacing your interrogator with a raging undead. The footage on the screens around you also changed to be more horrific by showing scenes of zombies, other creatures, and people in hazmat suits, while the now iconic Damned plays in the background. Seriously, the simple piano loop and atmospheric sounds of this song bring back so many memories of late nights with the boys grinding easter eggs or high rounds. It's a thing of beauty, truly. But that's all I'm going to say about zombies for now. Don't worry, this mode will get its own series of videos someday. Like I said at the top of this video, I was inspired by the mediocrity of recent Call of Duty games to come back and revisit this title. I was curious if it was as good as I remembered, or possibly even better. Thankfully, I can say with full confidence that Call of Duty Black Ops is a true masterpiece through and through. You can feel the passion and attention to detail the developers had when making this game. It comes through in every loading screen, level, cinematic, character, music track, gameplay loop, and even the goddamn main menu. 
It was crafted with so much care and love that it honestly blew me away. COD games today just don't feel like this anymore, and it was extremely refreshing to go back and experience this beautiful title once again. I can't wait to go on to Black Ops 2, and I hope you'll join me when we get there. Thank you so much for making it all the way to the end of this video. It means a ton. I'm experimenting here with a new format that I've always wanted to try out, so please let me know what you think and if there's anything I could improve for the next one. Or let me know your thoughts and feelings on Black Ops 1. Did you play it back in its prime, or are you a newcomer trying to figure out what all the hype is about? I'd love to know. With that being said though, I'm out of here. Make sure to take care of yourself, get plenty of rest, drink lots of water, all that good stuff. And I hope to see you again real soon. Peace.